We are the biggest, we are the largest, we are the highest, we are the greatest, we are the tallest. African spiritual platform, I'm always queen. Hadasha Komi Empress Makida, I am Labraska, the sun goddess, the spear of destiny. I am preaching African awakening and consciousness. We need to liberate our continent, that's my job. I welcome you with lots of love, 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 love. My people, it's another great day. It's going to be a great, great, great episode. We have one of our fathers here who is going to share a very important experience with us or story with us. And uh, let's welcome him on set for today. Papa, we welcome you to Revelations. Thank you. Great. Uh, it's your first time on this bigger platform. That's Please true. kindly introduce yourself to us and then um, let us know who you are. And then after you pay obeisance to the followers and the okay. subscribers of this platform. Hello, everybody. Okay. And uh, it's great to be here. It's a very wonderful opportunity to be here to have a, a little chat with you about who I am and, and what I've done as a filmmaker. I'm Ni Kwate O, a Ghanaian filmmaker with over 53 years experience in film production. I made my first film in 1970. This is the film about entitled You Hide Me, which was an expose of the hidden artifacts and rare crown jewels of the Asante Empire in the secret vaults of the British Museum. Um, I've made other films since then, several other films, documentaries, and my my first feature film was titled Ama. It's been made about 33 years ago. So that's a brief introduction. We welcome you once again. Can you can you greet your people in your language? Yo, be chemeke nyeme, ming hanye fe umaji ni mimbi umaji kuni umaji ababla wafe. No, I'm going to make my baby. 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 Yeah. That's beautiful. I we sometimes want to promote our own. Uh, so I want to know. I'm not saying speak Ghan. English mm. is okay. But I want to know whether you are on the grounds. And uh, now you've proven it. We welcome you. So, um, you've been filming movies since? 1970. 1970? Yeah, more than half a century ago. Yes. Yeah. That is like 54 years. Yes, absolutely. Are you still doing it? Yes. Currently, I'm in the, the production process of uh, fundraising uh, for a five-part docudrama series on the history of the Asante Empire of gold. Why the Asante Empire? Why the Asante Empire? Why the Asante Empire? You are gone. Listen, uh, I'm half Akwamu and half gone. Okay. So I am not, I mean, the question why the Asante Empire, let me try and, and respond to that. I am interested in all the major empires that have you know, reason in Africa. And uh, my interest in doing a film on the Asante Empire is based on the fact that the Asante Empire was the most highly developed in our part of the world. I'm talking about the Gold Coast. The most highly developed uh, empire in, uh, compared to all the other states because they were expansionist and they were able to um, expand into different parts of the country in terms of their ability to um, impose their ideas on others. I mean, for example, you will agree with me that even though I find it a bit, uh, how would I say it? I mean, if you come to Accra, for example, Almost everybody communicates in three, which I find sometimes a bit um, 
uncomfortable. And uh, I'm a gun. I'm, I says I'm a half gun and a half a gun. And the tree language is a dominant language. We have to accept it, whether we like it or not. It's just like Swahili is a dominant language. South Africa. In East Africa and so and so and so forth. So it's a, a dominant language for communication. Um, so that's the reality. I mean, we have to face the reality. And I'm not only interested in the Asante Empire. I'm also working on uh, some ideas with a group of people on the history of the Ghan state, how the Ghan state evolved. I'm also interested in uh, other regions. I'm interested in the, the history of the north, northern part of Ghana. So I'm not only interested in the history of the Asante. I'm interested in documentation of the history, our history from wherever region we come from. So me as a filmmaker, I'm a historian, if you like, let me put it that way. Um, there are other filmmakers in the industry who are interested in making films, you know, but they are not interested in the history, recording history. I'm specifically interested in the history of Africa. Yes, the history of Africa. Okay. And so um, Papa, so since you are interested in filming the history of Africa, I'll mm. ask you just two questions that we come into okay. your topic. Looking at entire African continent, name three things that you think it has caused us so bad. Well, for example, you and I are sitting here and communicating in a foreign language. That's number one. Mm -hmm. We should be communicating in a Ghanaian language. Mm -hmm. So the, the colonizer, I'm talking about the invasion of our environment by uh, foreign colonial powers, which culminated not only in the massacre and the destruction of our uh, society and domination, but also after they came with their guns, the missionaries followed with their Bible. And they continued the Bible as we speak today they translated the Bible into all the local languages. And uh, the Bible is the most dominant, uh, I mean, let me be more precise. Uh, the Christian religion has overcome our own traditional religion. And the Christian religion is the most dominant religion in Ghana today. Now, so religion should be free. Everybody should be free to practice what kind of religion they want. But in this context of what we are talking about, we find ourselves, as I said earlier, communicating in a foreign language. So that shows you how psychologically colonization has affected our minds and psyche. Because even from kindergarten, I mean, now everywhere you go, most places you go, you find that parents communicate with their children in English. Is that not true? I mean, it is a fact. For instance, I was walking by a plantain cellar in my neighborhood, and I, s I just overheard her communicating with her little toddler in some broken English, B.O. You know, so I said, oh, mommy, I don't I mean, Ubanu, I don't think I won't find you. Wankasa. Ukasa. Ukasa, Ukumkasa. Because your language is your soul, and you will cry. That's what your language is. So if I call you Jacob, there's a difference between Jacob and Kofi, right? If you are in the middle of a crowd, and you see, that's the issue to uh, even our names. I don't know any European or British woman called Adwa or Ama or whatever. So I'm saying that they are you're talking about the elements that came together to mm. create this situation you are talking about that caused and affected us. These are some examples of, you know, I mean, it is a very devastating, uh, people take it so much for granted. And I mean, I, I, I find it really uh, traumatic because I've been through it from kindergarten until I went through a process in which I began to change my mindset. And it has to do with the educational system because the educational system was a system they brought and imposed on us. I was talking to my colleague 
uh, Edwin, you know, Bafo, about the Adinkra symbols. That, for example, there's a man called Dr. Kojo Atha who has written a remarkable book on the history of Adinkra symbols, symbols that our ancestors were using to communicate and other things. So we have lost all these things. And hey, where are we going? Hmm, where are we going? Was he here when I was recording? Hmm. You are watching the biggest and the largest. It's sad. Sometimes you don't know what to say, but we keep moving. So, Papa, that is um, what you think is actually damaging us as Africans. There's a lot more than that, but, you know, we don't have enough time. Otherwise, you know, I mean, there's, uh, if you look at different levels, both at the political level, at the cultural level, you know, and, uh, I mean, you know, there are so many aspects of our daily lives as Africans. I mean, Africa is the only continent, I believe, uh, well, in Latin America, there are continents, that, but Africa is the only continent, I, I may be wrong, that communicates. Its national languages are communicated in four foreign languages. English, Portuguese, French, and Spanish. Your language is your soul. So that's, for example, the, the, the way they use language. Language was a weapon. Is Africa still in slavery? Mentally. Not physically, of course. I mean, we are not in sitting in here in chains. Yeah. But the, the psychological and the mental slavery, you know, that has, um, you know, I mean, overwhelmed us. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, sometimes it makes me very sad. I become very emotional. I don't want to get emotional here. But I'm saying that... Uh, when you think about it and you are able to recollect and reconnect with your past in history, which most people are not in a position to do because the educational system, I mean, doesn't offer them the opportunity to do that. And so, you know, there's, um, we are in a serious dilemma. Hmm, God help us. Hmm. Um, um, slave trade or the slave thing that happened to Africans, hmm are the major, the heaviest event ever in the world, not in Africa, mm. the heaviest event ever that has ever happened in the world. Do you think Africans, the pain that happens here, or the blood that was poured here, mm. is also dealing with us somehow, or it's just the, 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 the mental uh, slavery? Well, you see, apart from the massacres they committed, like the Sagranti War, where they, I mean, and they, everywhere they went, they, they, they committed, you know, massacres, you know. And uh, the, the, the point is that, you see, these, the effects of these activities and the regime and the, 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 the mindset they brought into our society, that you know, uh, okay, let me give you one concrete example. The word, expression, obroni, do you know the meaning of obroni? The, the actual meaning of obroni. In Ga is blofonyo. In Ewe is yevu. In uh, Yoruba is oyibo, oyimbo. Now, you see, our ancestors were smarter than us. Obroni is nipa obo abro. You understand? When our ancestors came into contact, Obroni, when our ancestors came into contact with them, they said they came for to trade. And they were very tricky. And our ancestors realized that this, when you are involved in a transaction with him, and you find that he wants to chip in your products in a, and, and try to overwhelm you with some Azam moves in order to, you know, you is like make sure your products are cheaper and, and so on and so forth. And if you resist any attempt to, at the bargaining process, they, he will probably end up grabbing you and your products and enslave you. So our ancestors called them by their correct names. Like in Ghana, it's Mene Ablofo. Mene Boablo Ablofo. And if you go along the coast of Africa, wherever they have been, the expression that our people used to describe them means the same thing. But now, 
Obroni is now Mibroni, oh, Mibroni, it has become a word of praise. Can you imagine that? We've turned the, it's like turning logic on his head. So this is something which is hmm. another serious phenomenon. It's a serious thing. Hmm. Very, very serious. But our ancestors are not like angry with us. It's our own mental slavery. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, are they yeah, angry you know. with us? No, no. We, we, you know, I mean, if they could see us now, they probably say, oh, so finally somebody is telling them like it is, you know. Yeah. But, you know, there you are. So. Mm. You are watching the biggest and the largest. Sometimes when you talk about these things, Nana, Ure, Yahoo, we are not saying we should get bitter. No. But I feel uh, we are at a point where we can actually liberate ourselves, the brain. But when I'm here, Koka, Ebinumu didi hunti no. Koka na. Will Africa be great again? Well, that's it will be dependent on the generation, the youth today in Africa. I mean, if I can, I don't want to go into politics, you know, because I mean, if you talk about African. The question to answer your question briefly will africa be great again i think it will be dependent first of all of an awakening in the educational curriculum system that we are using the educational curriculum if talking about will africa be great again the greatness again will become it will be a, a, a process of rediscovery who you are who am i if you ask yourself who am i you see we are not even asking ourselves who am i and the youth today for me, the future is the youth of Africa. And, but if their ideas are dominated by foreign uh, products or foreign ideas and etc., and so on and so forth. For example, to me, um, making films in African languages, really, local indigenous languages, should be the way forward in order to communicate our ideas. Come on, would you say Negu? Hey, Negu. He just my mouth will put mm. me in trouble one day. Mm. Let's yeah. leave that one, Papa. Mm. Let's leave that one. Africa will be great again. The youth, the youth are awakening now. You can see. Well, uh, there is an awakening. I've mm. come across, you know, different groups. You know, I don't think it's all is lost. I think that there is an yes. awakening. Mm. There, there is, is a process. It is. It's like a a bushfire. You know. It, you know, it's like it's a fuse. You light a fuse, and at the end of the fuse is a keg of gunpowder. Yeah. Metaphorically speaking. Yeah. So the process is 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 unraveling. Itself. Yes, it is. Yes, it's happening. Okay, Abu Somebody will ask. Nadia and I are discussing. The topic itself is you hide me. That's the topic. But his experience in filming. Real stolen African art in the basement of the British Museum is going to tell us about his um, experience. Do you remember? Um, there are some that are open. When you visit the museum, you will see uh, Chidom Hine was here. We had a bit of conversation about it. But this one had opportunity to get into where he's not, he's not supposed to get there, whether the ancestor took him there, whether it was his mind, whichever way he went there and came out, and now we have him here. I think the energies themselves protected him. That's my mind, though. That's what we are going to discuss today. I added the energies or the ancestors because I tell you, even this platform, they are behind it. If it is, they are behind you, you go through uh, any angle that you feel this one, I can't come out, they will bring you out. They don't just feel fuel and catch thieves. They can do greater stuff. I have told you, our, our deities are not bush people. They are astronauts. They, are, they do greater stuff. You know, that's why I add them to everything. They are beyond powder and dancing, you know. We'll get there one day. So I'm giving the platform to Father to take us through. I want you to get uh, water and book with you whilst you watch this because these are things that we don't normally get opportunity to hear. So Papa, the topic is you hide me and then your experience in the filming rare stolen African art in the basement of the British Museum. Okay. Please talk us through. During my period in the, in the London Film School, because I studied, you know, cinema. Um, 
even to rewind a little bit, when I was in high school in Ghana, Kwabuchi to be precise, in Fanspin School, my favorite subjects were history and art, was history and art. So the uh, graduation film, everybody has to make a graduation film. And most of my colleagues in film school were doing all kinds of stuff, you know, I mean, contemporary stuff and whatever. Something about life in England, life in Britain, etc. But I don't know, you know, I want to move beyond that. So the first thing that occurred to me was, okay, history. So I said, okay, let me take a, a walk and visit the British Museum, because that's where history is more or less, you know, concealed in all manner of exhibitions, etc. So I took a walk to the British Museum, and as you said, when you enter the exhibition hall, there are, uh, I mean, the British Museum is an amazing place. There's the Egyptian section, the Syrian section, and the Assyrian section, and the African section. So I went to the African section, because it interested me. And I was amazed when I got there, it was a, a huge chamber, I mean, it's a hall, which, you know, you can see as far as the eye can see, you know, surrounded by glass cases, all the way from the ground to the ceiling, behind locked doors, locked glass cases, where hundreds of artifacts displayed, you know, with little, you know, descriptions under it. This from the Congo, this from blah, blah, blah. And I was overwhelmed by what I saw, because, I mean, the art of Africa, it was almost like captured and was being displayed. Because they said we were primitive. I mean, when you visit the Africa session of the exhibition hall, the, the notion that we were primitive and stuff like that will begin to dawn on you that no, there's something funny. Yeah, there's you know, there's something really funny behind this thing. So I decided that no, this I think this is my subject, this should be my subject matter. I'll make a film about African art. So I decided to make inquiries and I went through the process. Uh, I was introduced to the, the uh, information department. So I made an appointment to, to meet the curator, okay? But also, the time I was in UK at that time, you see, I evolved uh, in terms of my political consciousness from the colonial mentality into an African mentality. Mm. So I became part, I joined a, a, a diaspora movement, a British, black British uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. organization called the Black Unity and Freedom Party. I became a member of the Black Unity and Freedom Party. And I mean, they were a, a group of, you know, diasporans who were constantly debating about Africa, about their condition, about racism and discrimination against them in England and so on and so forth. So I was coming from that, you know, background. And also, we also always were dressed in black. Black was our uniform to make a statement. Black beret, you know, black shirt, black overcoat, black, you know. And so I thought to myself, no, I don't think I can appear at this interview in the, the way, because I was a radical at that time. So I decided, no, I took a look at myself in the mirror at home and I said, no, I have to change costumes. So I went to the West End of London and rented a three-piece suit. Three-piece suit with a, the waistcoat and the chain and the clock, the watch, the little watch here. And uh, I was going to put on a hat, but I thought that would look really, I would look really silly with a hat on. So on the day of the appointment, first of all, I had to work hard together with uh, friends and support, you know, from my colleagues to raise the money because they charge 500 pounds to shoot in the museum. And the conditions, so wait, let me quickly rewind. So I went to the appointment. On the day of the appointment, uh, I went to the office of the curator. And when he opened his door, he welcomed me because when, what stood in front of him was a colonized African. So he came from behind his desk and came to warmly welcome me and said, what can I do for you? Gentlemen, sit down. I said, I'm here to 
congratulate you to let you know that I'm not only highly impressed with the exhibition, the Africa session that you have downstairs, but that if it hadn't been for you and people like you in the colonial days, all these artifacts would have disappeared. The Africans would not even know what to do with these artifacts and none of them would have existed in a, if it hadn't been for you this artifacts will not at have this been point they will see the primitive thing they are talking about in you so hey. you see the english there's a saying that the englishman's best friend is his dog the dog and an englishman so, turn so i use dog and i use the strategy of a dog you know when you throw a bone mm -hmm. so you i threw him a bone mm -hmm. so he fell for it wow i said i'm here to glorify you so he said look what you saw in the base in the in the exhibition hall is only two percent jesus of what we have it in our be collection only two percent because he was impressed by my presentation mm -hmm. okay He's got so he said come he come with me follow me i followed him to an office to a door at the end of his office and when he opened the door there was a spiral iron spiral staircase descending i followed him we, I, we descended about 50 feet on the ground beneath the british museum and I tell you, when we hit the basement of the British Museum, I couldn't believe my eyes and what I saw. First of all, what hit me as we descended into the basement was an aroma. There was some aroma of wood, ancient wood. I mean, you can, I could smell our ancestors. Mm. I mean, it's, it was unbelievable because it was like when I hit the basement, it was like, I could feel them saying, welcome, great, 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 great son. We have been waiting for you. Mm. So I took a look around and he said, this is the basement. This, you can see as far as the eye can see, you know. I said, okay, fine. So we made a deal. He said, it's going to cost you 500 pounds because... And I said, I want to, okay, 500 pounds, then I would like to shoot. I need, I would need a week because the amount of material which I came across there, you know. He said, no, no, no. Not even the British, no, none of the British television networks, none of the major British television network, BBC, ITV, none of them have been allowed here with their camera. You are the first person because. And you are looking for five days. Because, you know, my sympathy. I empathize with you because I was a former colonial district officer in Nigeria. So I know your country, I know Africa very well. So when I, I saw you, I thought, okay, let me do him a favor. So you can only shoot in it from nine to five, one day, just a day. So we made a deal. I went and raised the money and came back with the production crew. And when we finally entered the basement, I, came, I went with one of our sisters who was a, stu a law student. She's in the movie, you know. I decided not to go alone. I, I wanted a sister mm -hmm. to come with me yeah. so to share. I, I couldn't just go and tell this story all by myself. So we went together. And when we arrived at the basement, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of artifacts locked in boxes and plastic bags as far as the eye can see. You wouldn't believe it. It's like, a, and you see people running in uh, workers, you know, uh, British Museum workers in electric vehicles carrying, you know, artifacts, moving them from one location to the next location. And it, there was a lot of activity there. So quickly, we set up our cameras and started opening the boxes. And what we saw there, sometimes we came across some amazing artworks in different f f forms of metal, apart from gold and, I mean, whatever. And we used to just park the cameras. We were so fascinated. We had to even just stop filming and touch these objects. I mean, to touch these ancestral mm. objects, you know, and artworks and etc. I mean, it was something. I mean, I was emotionally over overwhelmed. Mm. So people ask me about the, you know, the commentary. I remember there was a screening once in a, an event, and an African American a sister from the diaspora said to me, "Oh, this commentary on the film you said you made 50 years ago. It sounds like." It was recorded yesterday. Mm. So I said, look, the commentary of the film unraveled in my head, in my mind, as I was going through the things. The commentary was written 
My ancestors gave me all the, they, 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 they gave me all the ammunition. That's that why the family says, you hide me. Mm. So, and I feel, I believe that I'm an ancestral messenger. Mm. Because I was the first African filmmaker to expose mm. for the first time ever these hundreds of thousands of stolen artworks you know, apart from the ones they got from the Sagranti Wall, from the Benin and etc. So hey, briefly, that was my experience. So when I came out, I said, wow, man. So that's how my first talking about my experience. Of course, later on, the film was edited, you know, through some contributions and uh, financial support by some organizations in the UK and so on and so forth. And then we decided to have a, a premiere at the Africa Center. The Africa Center was a center in London where Africans from all parts of Africa organized their cultural events, you know, music and stuff like that. So I went to see the director of the Africa Center and she was a British woman, a British woman who loved Africa. And so I told her about this film which I've just made. She said, oh, that's fascinating. And she said, okay. I'm going to do something that will surprise you. She said, look, I'm going to help you to launch this film in a big way. So she invited professors from Oxford, Cambridge, and all the major, you know, uh, educational institutions in the UK and the African community. The information was sent out widely. And Africa Center Hall was quite a big hall. It, you know, c contained about 500 people. So I invited, on the day of the premiere, I invited the British Museum authorities. So they came. Four of them came. It was around February. It was a little cold at that time. They came with their overcoats. I had seats lined up in front for them. Of the, for them. They said, no, 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 no. They preferred the back seat. They went to the back seat. I was watching them throughout the whole time. And uh, when the film started rolling, and the commentaries started rolling and they had the tone and the mood of the commentary. They, I was watching, they got up and put on their overcoats and slipped away out of the hall. When the lights came back on, I was giving a standing ovation and people were asking all kinds of questions and etc. So I said, wow, at least I've answered the call of my ancestors. Mm. So I decided, okay, let me take this film to Ghana, my country, to try and see if I can, after the reception at the Africa Center. So I came to Accra, went to Ghana TV, Ghana Broadcasting Service, mm -hmm. went to meet with the managing director of the whole station. And I told him that this is what I have and uh, it's about African art. And he said to me, he said, look, young man, you can't bring any rubbish. He hasn't seen it. I mean, the man hasn't even seen the film. <gasps> but because I told him the story, I narrated a little story behind the film you had me. And that, uh, you know, we have programs like Tom Jones and Bonanza, I mean, American programs and stuff like that. We don't want, we don't need any, med any mediocrity here on our screens. So I said, look, uh, I was bold then, you know, I, I was becoming very bold after having been to the museum, you know, I, spiritually, I was emboldened. Mm -hmm. I said, look, excuse me, sir. I'm a Ghanaian citizen, and I have, deserve, I have a right to put my product on Ghana television. If you are bringing foreign products, products that are not Ghanaian, you are, mm. you know, so I think I need, I deserve, you know. So I think he was taken aback by, because he, I guess his first reaction was, he thought that I would just crumble and, and disappear. So I said, okay, uh, I want to organize a preview here. He said, no, no, you have to do it outside. So there was a German cultural center that used to be known as the Fred Eber Foundation. Now it's the Goethe Institute. Uh, somebody suggested I should go and see them because they have a small cinema. I went there and they were very happy. They said, yeah, yeah, sure. So I invited uh, Ghanaian filmmakers and tele working in Ghanaian TV at the broadcasting station. Can you mention some of them? Their, their names. Mm, so oh. we are changing. Okay, there was only one person because 
This was 50 years ago. Uh, so if you can even Listen, there's, there's one, one, we know our heroes. No, there's one key person who played a major role in the, in the, in the preview. He's called Teddy Konu. Teddy Konu was a journalist with the Daily Graphic at the time when uh, Cameron Dodo was the editor of the Daily Graphic. Teddy Konu was my late younger brother's classmate in elementary school. So I met him and he said, oh, let me, I'm working for the graphic so I can cover it. Okay, so he came to cover it and the, next, the following day, there was a long editorial in the Daily Graphic praising the film, saying that this film must be seen by everybody else. You know, I can't recall the names of the... The, the ones you can, the yeah, ones you can yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, anyway, so Teddy Konu, I mean, the thing, boom, hit. So I took the graphic, copy of the graphic, and went back to, <laughs> to the GTV uh, mm. to see the director. I said... Uh, yes, I've done what you suggested. The preview has taken place. And this is what the National Daily is saying in the editorial. He looked at me and frowned. He said, look here, let me tell you something. We have a cordial relationship. There's a cordial relationship between this country, our Ghana, and the British ambassador here, and the British government. You can't come and throw a monkey wrench into this relationship. You understand? You can't just come and throw so something. So this TV thing didn't start yesterday. If you are not a joker, no chance for you, for some of them. Please continue. Why? Then he said, look, national security has, you know, is watching you. Your presence here and your motives, the reasons why you came here is under scrutiny. And if I were you, young man, I would jump on the next plane and disappear out of this country. I mean, he was very blunt. Very, very vivid and very blunt. Hey. So I took his advice seriously. National security, wait a minute. And this was the period when... Um, uh, Who was the president Buzia. by then? Buzia. Professor Buzia was in power. And it was also that period when, uh, as the president or uh, the prime minister, he was advocating for, you know, that was when apartheid in South Africa was really at its apex, you know, suppressing people. And he was advo advocating for dialogue with South Africa instead of supporting the liberation movement to fight for their freedom, but to dialogue with the white people. So I, within that context, I really could understand what the... The man is uh, telling you what he's telling yes, you. Yes, that, you know... So I jumped on the next plane, and when I arrived in London, to my surprise, West Africa magazine picked up the editorial. West Africa magazine is a magazine that was read all over. In those days, it was the only paper that, mm -hmm. you know, a magazine that is distributed around the world. They picked up the Daily Graphic editorial, and the editor of the West Africa magazine invited me and I, I took him to the film school and showed him the film. So he did a fantastic piece uh, about the film, what happened in Ghana, and so on and so forth. So it went viral. The film went viral. So, well, in a, a nutshell, that's what happened after the film was banned in Ghana. Was of course, banned in Ghana? Yes, the film was banned Your in Ghana. Your own people? Yeah, it was mm. banned in Ghana. I will ask questions, but you continue. But interestingly enough, after the West Africa magazine publication, Nigeria, the National Museum of Nigeria, was the first African country to order a copy of the, of the film. And I remember the, the direct, name of the director of the museum at that time, in 1970, Dr. Ekpo Eyo. I remember that vividly. So he ordered a copy. In those days, Do you remember the manager of GBC, the name at that oh, time? Please. I can't remember. I mean, you I'm sure. They, we, we, I'm sure. You know, it's uh, maybe it's available in the archives. You know. Uh, I know, but, but if you, you don't you know, worry, but, yeah, continue. Yeah, because I mean, mm. I was so like. You, it's you fine. Know. So anyway, mm. Nigeria, Nigeria ordered a copy, and then um, after that, I tried to distribute it in in England, and I ran into a lot of problems. Problems because the distributors when they see the film and then they say, oh no, no, you know, 
we don't touch this kind of stuff. So in the end, I had to put the film away on the shelf and just forget about it for a while because I couldn't distribute it. In those days, there was no video. You know, celluloid film was the dominant format that people used. So I forgot about it. So I came back to Ghana on a visit in 1977. And I was introduced to Professor Efwa, the late Professor Efwa Sutherland, you know, who was at the University of Ghana, the Institute of African Studies. I met her and she said, oh, so you are Nikwate, oh, uh, I've read your, the West African magazine about your film. Did you bring the film with us? I said, oh, yeah, I have the film with me. And he said, oh, okay, look, I'm going to arrange a, a screening of the film with the director of the Institute, Professor Kabana Nketia, Professor Nketia, who was then the director of the Institute. Mm -hmm. So he said, how many, I said, I have about a week to go back to England. So quickly she arranged a, a short, you know, a screening in a, a, a hall, me, my, myself, her, and Professor. And after the film, after the screening, Professor Nketia looked at me and said, young man, what are you doing in England, in the UK? I said, Prof, I'm sick and tired. I'm freezing cold because I can't even stand the weather. I just want to get out. And he said, okay, I like this film. I'm going to write a letter for you to take to the University of Ghana office in London and tell them to interview you because I want to employ you in my institute as a research fellow to come and develop a film department here. Mm. Boom. So I got a job. In Ghana? In Ghana. After the film was banned way back. No matter what it is, there yeah. are good people here. Yeah, Professor Nketia, I mean, mm. his soul rest, rest in peace. He was way ahead. And uh, so I just got a job like that, I thought, because I had been wondering, what am I going to do, you know, after? So quickly I packed my stuff and boom, I came to the university and I started uh, a unit called the Media Research Unit, which is now developed into the audiovisual department. And I made a few films for the university, but you had me was a film that brought me home. The answers, that's why I say I'm an answer. Okay, Trabbis so Trabbis. let's let's focus on you hide me. Right. Is the film still there? Now, um, in 2020, my son, my other son who's in the UK, in US, I'm sorry, US, called me and said, hey, Pop, there's a, a Philadelphia Film Festival, the Black International, Black Star International Film Festival, and somebody who had seen your film wants to use the film in the festival. So can you send? I said, oh, this film is an old film. He said, no. So quickly, I did a digital version and sent it to him. He calls me a few days and said, look, your film was given a standing ovation at the festival. And then the organizers of the Paris International Film Festival were there and they have been in touch with me and they want the film. They want to enter it into competition. But I know that in the scheme of things, in film festivals, the regulations is that if you want a film to be entered into com competition, the film should be up not more than a year old. It should be a recent film. But these guys wanted to enter a film that was 50 years old. So I said, okay. A week later, I got a call from my son. He said, your film has won the first prize. Mm. Was given the best documentary film prize. Mm. And my film competed with five other films from five different parts. Filmmakers from five different parts of the world. I was like, hey, the ancestors are on the move. Mm. So then the film went viral. I was getting calls from Japan, from everywhere. You heard me, can we see it? And so it's ever since then, the film has gone viral. So, you know, at the end of the day, I said, when well, I said, well, wait a minute. I think that as an ancestral messenger, what I should do is to translate the commentary, decolonize the commentary of the film in English into local indigenous African languages. So I said, wow, yes, that's the way to go. The only way the film can reach the masses on the ground, because now we have local TV stations mm -hmm. and institutions like you, yours here. Mm. So I decided to do a three language version. So I'm working on a three language version. And hopefully uh, it will be launched uh, with a special and at, with the uh, Otunfo 
Nana was said to do a Santini uh, as, uh, as our special guest. And, you know, there's uh, in sometime in February, you know, there's a Sagranti War commemoration was were held. And I was there with my production team. So I realized that if you hired me, is the tree version of you hired me is screened. Because in May, the second, second of May, the British are bringing their, can you imagine, they are bringing just a few, a few, with terms and conditions. I said, look, I mean, the armed robber comes and, you know, loots and murders your family and etc. And then later on, he says, okay, all your stuff that I've gathered, you know, now you, if you want them back, you know, I would give them to you as a loan. So anyway, something is coming back. I was it's going better. to ask you because we saw it on social media that yeah. Nana uh, uh, Ote Opimso has yeah. gone to yeah. UK to br bring some of our artifacts yeah. and all that. Yeah. So I was going to ask you anyway. So yeah. it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, it's not here yet. In May, well, the, uh, something has come. Okay. The Fala Museum in the in the US brought you know some stuff recently. Okay. In Kumasi, but the main the stuff what everybody is looking forward to is the major. The main stuff is what the British is bringing is on me. They are bringing on me in the second of May. Hmm. Apparently, you are yeah. watching the biggest yeah. and the largest. Um, I was, I am interested in the movie myself mm -hmm. personally, but we will talk about that uh, after mm -hmm. the show. Now, please, everybody watching us, a child born just two minutes ago, mm -hmm. and the very old man in Ghana that is watching us. Mm -hmm would want to know some of the artifacts you laid your eyes on. Yama yeah. Mention some for us. Look, I mean, I mean, um, you see, if you have the images of the film, then these things will be, you know, so I thought that maybe you could use some of the images. They were artifacts, pure gold, artifacts, royal regalia. I mean, pure gold of helmets. And, and swords and the design. I mean, if you look at the designs, I mean, you can see that. He so, what really happened? You ask yourself. I eh? mean, the, 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 if you see the creativity of our ancestors, and you can see that a lot of images have been stolen by Europeans and they have distorted it and made it into other things. But the Adinkra symbols and all these other symbols, which are amazing symbols. Oh, it's unbelievable. And the, the, the fact that we had craftsmen in pure gold met, you know, can you imagine? I mean, mine gold and, and, and melt it and transform it creatively into a work of art. People who didn't go to school. Man. I was telling you about craft and talent. Sunday, last two Sundays, one mm -hmm. of these Sundays, you watched it. It's sad though. It, can you tell us some of the inscriptions that they've written on these things? You see, the most annoying part about these artifacts in this rare ancestral, you know, artwork is the description mm -hmm. they put on it. Mm -hmm. um, gold cup uh, from Kumasi, uh, Asante Gold Coast. I mean, they don't understand the meaning of gold this. Cap. So they just describe, you know, gold sword, ceremonial sword, gold ceremonial sword. I mean, just very, ah. you know, uh, and, you know, the whole thing is just very, very annoying. I mean, what I saw with my own eyes in the basement and what I, the things that, the sacred objects that I touched and the artwork in the oh man, it's unbelievable. I mean I I, I was overwhelmed. Mm. You know? That's why I want to decolonize the film into uh, yeah, and into Hausa, into mm, but you don't have you to know. forget about our brothers out there to the Kenyans. Oh uh, listen, we are is you had me is going to take a walk mm -hmm. around Africa. Mm -hmm. So when I finish with Ghana. I'm moving on to Nigeria, Yoruba, Igbo, you know, and then to Swahili. I'm, I'm, in fact, I've already, I'm communicating with the people 
uh, who are ready to do the Swahili version. So, you know, the Kosa version, the Zulu version, and all that stuff. That's so, a great you know, vision. Yeah, so you have me, we have to be decolonized into so the African language. So they have languages. just written just... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It, so, so all our monies are there. The gold you saw there can change Ghana. It can take us out of IMF. It's, it's unbelievable. Let, let, me, let me ask this question. People, when you talk about the slave trade, People, some people, I don't know the word to use for them. I used to use the word the goons, but mm -hmm. I have stopped. Nobody is my what. People feel, when you talk about the slave trade and how these people were cunning and rah, 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 people are saying that our own people sold us out. They didn't do anything. You can't actually accuse them. What do you have to say about this? Okay, that's a very good question. You see, look, in every given society, as they say, uh, there's mensa in every group, right? There are people who resisted. Our, our, there were wars of resistance. Our ancestors resisted. They fought to resist the slave trade. There were people who fought. The, the white, the European, the colonizer came in with guns and the Bible. And then they used the, the method of identifying people within the community. Because there were people inside the community, they were, of course, in the minority. They were not in the majority. The majority of the people resisted. Because if your, your son, your child, your daughter, and I mean, your relatives are being captured, you don't go and, and start worshipping the, the, the colonizer and so on. So. But there were people, the people who collaborated with them uh, were in the minority. There were some you know, elements who they maneuvered through in some incentives and use them. Mm. Of course, when they had to go over into the interior to go and hunt for slaves, you know, they went with their uh, guns and powerful guns and et cetera. And they went with some Africans who they have, you know, uh, converted into their mindset. So it's true, there were some people, but what is important is to, they were in the minority, but they, what people don't talk about is the resistance. For instance, in 1861, there was a, it's, it's, this has been documented in the book written by a British uh, historian called History, uh, History of the Gold Coast and Asante by uh, Claridge, okay? In 1861, he described a very powerful rebellion in Cape Coast called the Great Cape Coast Rebellion. And the Great Cape Coast Rebellion was, the result happened because a group of slaves who had been captured processed through the castle, ready, waiting for the ship to come and take them away. They were all in chains in the dungeon. Something happened, and the slaves were able to rebel in the dungeon and to escape into the town. And the people welcomed them and supported them. And as a result of that, the governor of the castle came out with his guns and went into the community and demanded that, hey, you should give back these slaves. They are our property. We have we bought, bought them and we have them. them. So the people responded by attacking the castle. So there was rebellion. There are people, the Great Cape Coast Rebellion. Who knows about it? Nobody teaches about that. Mm, there, there is, I, I, I went to film the, that place mm. and we were told when Yas and Toa and Nana Prempe were captured yeah. with the children and the wife. Yeah. They were coming for them. They changed the place for them, and people were they were killing. And that, mm. that's when we got Kuma Pema Apembeba. Yeah, right. So they took them to Sierra Leone and ra ra ra. So so there uh, was resistance. Yes, I mean, was, there but, was. But know, there, and, there were some goons among us. Uh, uh, yeah, always. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, in every society, you know, there is, you know, an idiot. <laughs> so, you are watching the biggest and the largest, Papa. Um, right now at this moment looking at the castles where all these traumas and all this um, brutality and you people have English I don't have enough English for this happened these are places where our president sits and rule the country we all know about Osu castle they left it not quite long ago Cape Coast castle Elmina castle uh, they stayed there after the people has, had left. After the uh, independence, they, they, that's what's where the, the presidents and you can name them were sitting and ruling the country. 
What do you have to say about this? Is it okay? Is it proper? Of course, it's not proper. Look, I recorded a group of African American brothers and sisters from the U.S. on a visit. About about 200 of them. They came on a visit in 1997 to Cape Coast and Illumina Castle, and I was there with the camera and recorded their reactions. It was unbelievable, and the comments that they made about the fact that they, they thought that these castles should be converted into sacred, that they are like shrines of where our, their ancestors, our ancestors were kept. And it should not be a tourist bonanza. People come in, and but it should be a sacred place that should be used for educational purposes, real educational purposes, and reenactments, and etc. You know, so basically, I mean, also the Sioux Castle issue, well, it's a long story. But, well, the bottom line is that uh, the educational system, the way it is now, if it continues to be unchallenged and allowed to run amok, then, hey, we're going to have some serious problems. Hmm, we're going to have some serious problems. You are watching the biggest. My last question, then, I think um, we are gone. Recently, there is this thing that goes on in America. I know you know, Juneteenth. Yeah, Juneteenth. People asking for reparation and yeah, all that. Yeah, and right. recently, our president, um, Nana Adodankwa Ekufuadu, was also asking for reparation. What do you have to say about that? Well, my film, You Hired Me, was the first documentary that demanded reparation and restitution of all the items that have been stolen. Okay, so this issue of reparation and restitution is a big debate. And the issue is how much are the colonizers ready to release back into the system? You see, it is, it's a very interesting debate. And the question is that there was a, a lawyer, a Spanish lawyer. I came across him online and he was ready to act as a, a legal advisor to the Ghana government to, to take all the major museums to the Hague, the court. You know, there's an international court in the Hague where, you know, and he was convinced that if they were ready, he was, but I don't think anybody listened to him. But he was convinced that he had the, you know, there were some international clauses in, you know, stolen artifacts, and, but nothing happened. So the bottom line is that um, they are still in control of the, of the artifact. They are still sitting on. Is there any reason they don't want to return it? Well, you see, the wealth of the material they are sitting on is not a joke. And it's like a loot, you know? And you see, the definition of Africa as primitive and uncouth and etc. these artworks, debunks, totally debunks that nonsense. And so by returning it is like admitting that, oh, I mean, you know, we what told... What we said was a lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a you know yourselves, lie, you, know. you were good yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely it will expose them. <sighs> so... Please, do you think this, th these things that they are keeping is, is the reason why we are poor? Well, I think that we are sitting on, on wealth in Africa. I mean, below us, the ground. As we so why now. we why are they saying we are poor? Well, you see, uh, I don't want to get into that because if I get into that, it's going to be a, a long political debate and discussion. But we ourselves, we are our own worst enemies in the sense that we have to, you know, begin to re-educate our people because poverty is also a poverty of the mind. You see, when we re-educate our people to become conscious about their capabilities and what they are capable of achieving themselves, the initiative will come. And people will, you know, will rise up and, you know, and become more productive and more proactive. And you see, it's a mindset. The moment the mind is changed, you know, then the process will become an enlightenment. Ideas will rise up. And, uh, I mean... When you say the ancestors were with you, like I did in my um, 
um, intro. Mm. When um, life dwells in the blood, so anything blood has spilled on can carry life, mm. whether it's a tree or what have you. So you touched them. The fact that they have, there were blood on these things, they didn't take it easily. Mm. So you touched the ancestors. The ancestors' blood is life or souls for them. But we have deities here as a researcher. You said mm. you were a researcher. These deities that are in Ghana, our ancestors were not treating them the way we are treating them. Why didn't they help them in any way? Well, see, Was there any reason? You see, look, we must understand the fact that the colonizer, wherever they have been, they have been there with firepower. I mean, the reality of firepower is different from, you know, when you, you don't have... anything. When you have, we don't have the capabilities. You see, for example, one of the major... Uh, reasons why they were able to dis destroy Kumasi and burn down Kumasi. They used the, there was a new gun called the Gatling gun. It was a new invention, a machine, machine gun, which can fire hundreds of, you know, so, you know, it's firepower. I mean, you see, when, uh, what do you call it, uh, an entity which has developed technology in terms of firepower, to a higher level, comes in contact with another entity where the, the that uh, that can only be active the through weapons invocation, of, weapons of war, mm -hmm. and etc. are uh, not at that developed. I mean, the gun gunpowder. No matter how powerful you are, gunpowder, which was apparently invented by the Chinese, played a major role in the conquest of many nations. Gunpowder, mm. mm. the gun, mm. which was followed by the Bible. Mm. So as for Ancestors, I'm sure that spiritually they resisted, but they were overwhelmed with firepower. Mm. I mean, Kumasi was burned down to ashes hmm. more than 50 years ago. But the, the people have bounced back. So the Kumapim, Apim Beba, the, the people, have, when we went to Kumasi on, on that day, I mean, during the, the, the commemoration of that Segranti War, I mean, I was amazed at the, at the intense crowd that. The people who came there and they were very they, they come up in, up in, they, they have they have bounced back again. The people have bounced back again and they are, you know, now observing their own, you know, history and hmm. their own you know You are watching the ancestors. biggest there is time for everything. There is time for everything. The fact that your eyes have seen those things, that person, that energy that sent you there to see it with your eyes will most definitely raise somebody who will bring them home. This one, I'm so sure about this. Your last words to the youth, please encourage us as black people. Give us three things that you think we should, you've said what we should do about educational system and all that. Please, your last words, your advice to all of us, if there are any social media. Handles. My last word will be uh, directed to media workers. Media is a very powerful weapon. Whether you are writing information, disseminating in a newspaper, or now we know the television, the, the movie image is the most dynamic. So anybody who is involved in this uh, uh, area must realize that you know when you are holding a camera, and those, the instruments of production constitute a very powerful weapon. So the product, Art, the form and content of your artwork, the form and content of the, your product, because every artwork is like a commodity. It's like a product. Uh, you, you plant a mango and it, it, it. So the form of your artwork is, should be easily recognizable as something that when people see this, oh, this thing is thought provoking. You know, the, the, the form, the, that's what you call the form and content of every work of art must have a message and the content of your work or art is the the content must be something that will emancipate people and raise consciousness of the people to become aware of who they are who are we who am i you we the media workers and who are involved in this area must answer these questions by using powerful images to tell our story 
the true story. Hmm. Papa, thank you so much. We do appreciate you. So you are now in Ghana, living. You are now living here. Oh yeah, I'm busy. Are, yeah. are you happy here? Oh yeah, well, I'm. Um, home is sweet home. Yeah, I'm. Um, you know. Are you paying e levy? <laughs> oh, I'm paying everything that everybody it's is supposed paying. to be. Yeah, it's paying. So, uh, mm. you know. Okay, uh, we are done, mom. But yeah. recently, they passed a law about homosexualism and gayism. Please, I mean, I don't believe in that. You know, gay nonsense. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because uh, it has nothing to do with our culture. Totally nothing to do with our culture. It was something that was introduced into our society by the colonizers. The colonizers came with it as part of the things they left behind. These are some of the results of um, brainwash. Yes. Papa, thank you so much. We you appreciate welcome. you. you thank welcome. you so much. You're welcome. Hey, it's another day. Oh. Thank God I'm in black. I'm emotional. Mm. Thank God. That could be be best you. That could be be best you. Gain your consciousness. What? Liberate yourself. Eh? Liberate yourself so you are able to liberate your continent. It's not about weapons. Right now, at where we stand, it's about knowledge. Liberate the brain. I show you. So, I'm friend. I'm going to go back to our bandit. 